Will you join me in prayer? Eternal Spirit, to whom we ascribe all praise, teach us that as we honor each other, in truth we honor thee. Bless us with the wisdom to admire those who have given much rather than those who have accumulated much. Kindle us with the ambition to share more than we succeed and temper us with the knowledge that in the light of thy perfection, our own imperfection should be a source of both challenge and good humor. Amen. I extend a warm welcome to all of you, members of the Platform Party, trustees, faculty and staff, representatives from other academic institutions, students, parents, and friends. I declare the formal opening of this academic convocation to celebrate the installation of Dr. Karen Wiley Sandler as Vice President and Dean of Academic Affairs of Juniata College. I will now turn the program over to President Robert W. Neff. I would add my warm welcome to the one already extended by Dr. Ellis. This is a special day in the life of Juniata College the day on which we will install a new academic dean. Maya Ying Lin, a student in architecture at Yale University, was 21 years of age when she won the competition to create a design for the National Memorial to Vietnam War veterans. Maya's design was selected over those submitted by 1,420 others. Many of them were noted architects, sculptors, and lands landscape architects. One of the judges stated about Maya's design. It is contemplative and reflective. It is superbly harmonious with its site and yet frees the visitors from the noise and traffic of the surrounding city. The names of the 57,892 men and women who died in the war are inscribed on the memorial in chronological order, beginning with the first fatality and ending with the last. Thus the war's beginning and end meet. The war is complete, coming full circle, wrote Maya Lin in a statement for the competition. Maya Ying Lin received her bachelor's degree in 1981 and her master's in architecture in 1986, both from Yale University. In 1987, Ms. Lin received an honorary doctorate of fine arts degree from Yale University. Gary Trudeau, and Ms. Lin, both receiving honorary degrees from Yale at the age of 27, are the two youngest to receive such degrees in the history of Yale University. Dr. Lin has created another sensation with the Civil Rights Memorial to be dedicated in Montgomery, Alabama in a few weeks on November 5th. The memorial is a 12-foot circular stone tablet with a thin sheet of water flowing across its surface Beneath the flowing water are the names of 40 persons killed in the struggle and 21 key civil rights events. About the memorial, Dr. Lin has said, the ability to see and touch the names glistening in the water and simultaneously to see one's, another's, one's own reflection will add to the sacredness of the site. Today, Dr. Lin will speak to us on the topic, reflection on art, within society. As embarrassed as I am honored, honored to speak before you today, I am much more accustomed to my works as opposed to my words speaking for me. But today I'll try to explain with words my works, but I make no promises. I never would have envisioned this day or this stage when Elizabeth Baker, a little over a year ago, first asked me to design for Juniata an open-air chapel. In fact, a little over a year ago, I must confess to not exactly knowing where Huntington was. <laughs> but I feel that I've come a long way, not just in travel time, since then. 
and I've come to realize that though slightly set apart, Juniata is hardly isolated from the world. In fact, it was Juniata's concerns for world peace which initially brought me to your campus, where I have found a most understanding audience with which to work. As an artist somewhat familiar dealing with public suspicion or outrage over new ideas, new works of art, I have found in my discussions with President Neff and those at Juniata concerned with the Peace Chapel nothing but enthusiasm. Working in such an open-minded environment, one that promotes and nurtures new ideas, allowing them to grow into their own voice, their own shape, has impressed me from the start about Juniata. And I thank Mrs. Baker for introducing me to your college. Mrs. Baker's ideas for an open-air chapel interested me from the start, the project being both socially responsive and site-specific. The chapel, a non-denominational gathering place to be used by the college's peace studies program, sited in a beautiful meadow into the hills, set into the hills overlooking the college, was an idea that I responded to immediately. For my work originates from a simple desire to make people aware of their surroundings. And this can include not just the physical, but the psychological world that we live in. This desire has at times led me to become involved in artworks that are as much politically motivated as they are aesthetically based, creating works which focus on some sobering realities of our age. I feel we cannot ignore such issues as the potential danger of nuclear war, the current increase in racial hostility across this nation, housing shortages, or the environmental deterioration of the earth. We have the power to destroy this planet many times over with our stockpiles of nuclear weapons. We know that in an instant, life on this planet could disappear and that we are causing the possible slow death of this planet with scientists locating and measuring the ozone hole, calculating the destructive effects of global warming, and witnessing the rapid destruction of the Amazon rainforests. We are only beginning to realize the immense effects mankind is having upon this planet. And at the close of this century, as we proceed into the next, we are seeing how we have unwittingly begun to shape the, the future of the entire planet. We must begin to take responsibility for our actions and hopefully begin to consciously work towards learning to live with not only our own kind, but with the planet itself. The question remains as to how we each successfully can affect or at least attempt change. Aside from the direct political roots, such as voting, writing your congressman, voicing your concern, which are extremely important, there is still the need for each one of us to affect change. The Baker's concerns and contributions to thoughts on world peace are truly inspirational. And I think in education, the potential for affecting change is enormous. The chance to make students aware of our responsibility to others is a challenge. But I leave that up to you. As for me, with these thoughts on my mind, I obviously did not choose science or politics as my forum to act upon these concerns. But instead, I have directed myself toward, towards fields that some may say are antithetical to these concerns, namely art and architecture. Architectural progress can and has been, has been and can be greedy, destructive, thoughtless. Yet design can be responsible to the community and its environs. Both in urban or rural settings, architecture can be a strong influence in our, in our relations with others. Yale, for example, grew up against its city, turning its entrances in, locking its gates, creating barriers that helped to amplify the hostility between town and college during the 60s and 70s. Architecture, though, can have a positive as well as negative effect upon, upon people and the land. Although man has tried to dominate the land, conquer it, applying a rigid order that has little to do with what was once there, I have seen examples in Japan, in the gardens of Kyoto, or in housing projects in Denmark and Norway, where the experience of the house becomes intertwined with the land, with the buildings framing the landscape becoming a part of it. Architecture has the potential to influence how we relate to each other and to the environment. My interest in art may seem less socially motivated. Art doesn't serve a specific purpose. It is not yet functional, yet I think nothing bothered me more during the controversy over the Vietnam Memorial than to be misunderstood as an elitist artist, only concerned with the look of her work, 
It saddened me to think that some couldn't see how art relates to people, that it is meant to communicate with people, or that an artist fights to retain the integrity of a work so that it remains a strong, clear vision that can truly affect people. Art is and should be the act of an individual, perhaps the elitist artist, willing to say something new, something not quite familiar. It is that collection of those singular, personal visions transformed from within the mind's eye to the public, which has throughout time, throughout our history, come to form a definition of who we are and in a way of why we are. It is a dialogue with not only our peers, but with people and times both before and beyond our time. And that we can truly understand words and images by men and women who lived hundreds of years ago. And that we can have been moved and influenced by the writings of Shakespeare, Plato, Ibsen, or the paintings of Leonardo, Manet, Rothko, reflects an understanding, a connection through time. For although each of us can be defined by the brief physical time that we as individuals exist, we have the ability to make that time extend far beyond our physical existence. We are part of a collective consciousness, connected to one another through time by our works, images, thoughts, and writings. We communicate to future generations what we are, what we have been, hopefully influencing for the better what we will become. All this may help, I hope, to explain what motivates me in my work. I have tried in my work to respond to our current situations, communi communicating to an audience an idea of our time, an accounting of history, yet I would hesitate to call myself a political artist. If anything, I would prefer the term apolitical as a description of myself. I do not choose to overtly comment upon historical facts. I am interested less in presenting my opinion than in presenting factual information, allowing the viewer the chance to come to his or her own conclusions. I create places in which to think without trying to di dictate what is thought, producing works that range from being motivated by social reasons, such as the Civil Rights Memorial currently being completed in Alabama, which President Neff has already spoken of, this memorial details the history of the civil rights era, with names and events listed together chronologically, presenting a timeline where one can see how people's sacrifices actually led to better legislation, or vice versa, where better legislation sad, sometimes led to more violence, sadly to say. Other works focus on more private levels of experience, works which invite the viewer into an artwork that changes subtly, to read it, it asks the viewer to notice a slight variation in shape, color, or form, to read into the sculpture a transformation, asking one to take notice, to step away from the normal passage of a day and see something slightly altered, and then to begin to question how one actually sees or experiences. A sculpture installation planned for Pennsylvania Station in New York is a series of fragmented ellipses suspended from the ceiling, each piece a calligraphic brush stroke that changes from one art to the next, in size, orientation, spacing. The piece follows your movement through the corridor, appearing to rotate through space, changing from a small fragment of an ellipse to a full ellipse at the other end of the corridor. One may or may not notice the progression of this work. That is up to the observer. A project for Charlotte, North Carolina Sports Center is a large park in which an arcade of trees surrounds a somewhat whimsical plain field, composed of spherical topiary, which appear to be rolling down a hill, inviting the audience into its imaginary game. The audience is very much a part of my artwork, wherein the work does not become complete until the viewer experiences it, giving him or her a sense of responsibility, involving the audience in the process. The process I work with creates a dialogue with its viewers, allowing a place of contemplation, sometimes an incorporation of history, always a reliance on time, memory, a passenger journey. There's a direct empathy between the form of the artwork and the viewer. It does not require a knowledge of, specific, of a specific language of forms, but instead relies on a direct response to the work. It has seldom been an isolated object, more often environmental works where the landscape becomes an integral part of the piece. The use of physical as opposed to symbolic languages, light, sound, texture, materiality, 
as opposed to a worn vocabulary of form, such as the symbolic difference between using a Doric or a Tuscan column, have helped to define my work. And beneath it all is a strong respect for the land. The work that I have done in both architecture and sculpture is site-specific. I read clues from the existing site, identifying one or two features that I choose to focus on and to build upon. I see my work as an additive rather than as a combative <coughs> process. What I choose to introduce into the land does not try to dominate or overwhelm the existing landscape, but instead tries to work with it to produce a new experience of that site. But all this begins to describe the design of the Peace Chapel, and I think I'll leave that to its dedication. I am very grateful to have been asked by Mrs. Baker to work with, on, work with her on her vision of a gathering place founded out of a concern for world peace. And I'm sorry that she could not be here today. I hope that this Peace Chapel works with Juniata to bring forth constructive ideas towards her vision and her hopes. Thank you. Dr. Lynn, thank you very much, Maya. Uh, you would never guess uh, how difficult it was for Dr. Lynn to give this address. She said, I would much rather have my work speak for itself. We thank you for enhancing our life with the Peace Chapel, for enhancing our life by the words that you brought today, and for connecting up with the Juniata community. We are very, very thankful. The next event isn't on your program, but it's on mine. The local Vietnam veterans wanted to have an opportunity to express their appreciation to Dr. Lin. I'm pleased to introduce Wilbur Smith, who was an infantryman in Vietnam and is now the Mount Union post commander of the veterans of the Vietnam War. Mr. Smith, we're very happy to have you part of this celebration today, and we invite you to make your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Nett. Good morning, everyone. We represent Post 23 Veterans of Vietnam War of Mount Union. I am Wilbur Smith. To my left, Arnold McClure, Sonny Lane, and Clyde Sykes. Maya, on behalf of Vietnam veterans everywhere, we'd like to thank you for your efforts in designing our Vietnam Memorial. No other design could be so fitting a tribute to our fallen comrades. Numbers are just numbers. But when we can look at the wall and see the names chiseled in stone, that's a constant reminder of the high price of freedom. The memories of our friends and brothers will live forever through your beautiful piece of work. We thank you and may God richly bless you. Thank you very much. to your position at Juniata College as Vice President and Dean of Academic Affairs. You bring an experience of 20 years in higher education, first as a professor and administrator at the University of Vermont, and more recently 
as Associate Provost at Gettysburg College. We're indeed fortunate that you bring the gifts as a scholar in the field of French literature. You have achieved curricular innovation, demonstrated budget management, and provided leadership in faculty development. You bring competence, energy, grace, and enthusiasm to your task. We are grateful to the Gettysburg community for graciously giving you up to us. And we welcome your husband, Peter, and you to this community as you officially take your place as Vice President and Dean of Academic Affairs at Juniata College. In your acceptance of this position, Dr. Sandler, you accepted this charge to articulate and advance the academic vision of Juniata College, to lead the faculty in the collegial traditions of shared governance and assure an effective and distinguished body of teachers and scholars by assisting in the recruitment of outstanding faculty and by encouraging the development of those faculty members already in place. You also received this charge to embody a commitment to student-centered outcomes and monitor student academic achievement. And as a member of the President's Administrative Unit, to provide information to the Board of Trustees and its committees, and to assure a deeper understanding among all constituencies of the academic enterprise. Dr. Sandler, I welcome you to your new position. We pledge to you our support in the leadership that you will provide. Earlier today, you heard pledges of support from Juniata students, parents, and faculty. With the help of these constituencies, you will forge an even stronger academic vision for Juniata College. Now, there's only one thing we overlooked. When you took your office, we did not provide you a history of the Juniata College. And I think it's fitting on this occasion to memorialize this occasion for you that we uh, give you the book, True Set Free, which will be provided by the Chair of the Board of Trustees. I don't know uh, exactly why you weren't given this, other than that it says truth sets free, and when you found out the truth about what your job would be in the school, you might decide to escape. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stanley, we invite you to respond. Thank you. Chairman Ellis, President Neff, Colleagues, friends, and honored guests, thank you for your greetings. I accept your pledges of support with a deep sense of privilege. Today's celebration offers me the occasion to reaffirm to you my commitment to Juniata College, to its academic mission, and to its people, faculty, students, staff, administrators, trustees, parents, and many friends. I do so with great joy. Today also marks our celebration of Higher Education Week, in case you didn't know, which began on Monday with recognition by the Merck Foundation of the Chemistry in Motion Project, a project which was originated by a group of local high school chemistry teachers and Juniata's Don Mitchell, a project which has received national attention as an outstanding example of productive collaboration between schools and colleges. And today we celebrate Elizabeth Baker's vision for a place of quiet worship and meditation, a vision brought to tangible expression through the talents and insights of Maya Lin. Moreover, today we celebrate Parents Weekend, a time to recognize parents as the world's best educators. How can we consider intelligence separated from cooperation? Can we define education exclusively as isolated effort, as thinking in a vacuum? Indeed, can we claim to educate students for the 21st century without teaching them the value and the techniques of collaboration? My response is, that we no longer have that luxury, if we ever did have it. What we are celebrating today stems directly from collaboration and cooperation. 
together, Elizabeth Baker and Maya Lynn have given us the Baker's Peace Chapel. Together, local chemistry teachers, Juniata faculty and staff, the National Science Foundation, and private donors have launched and sustained the Science Van Project. Let me offer one example of how collaboration worked for me. When I began to publish my research, I followed the same model I had learned in college. Write in solitary confinement. Struggle over your rewriting. Send off your manuscript and await the results. This may sound familiar to the students in the audience. It was pretty much a closed system and I didn't learn much about writing in the process. A few years ago, I participated in a workshop on teaching writing. I expected to learn how to help my students write better, but I learned a great deal more. I discovered that writing, good writing, is a profoundly collaborative endeavor. Of course, you write on your own, and you use your own words but you talk things over. You discuss formats and styles, and you share drafts. This is normal for most good writers, but I didn't know it until I had spent years of skulking and sulking and wondering if good writing depended more on luck than skill. I should have talked to someone earlier. That discovery not only improved my writing and my publishing record, it also greatly improved my disposition. And it improved my mind by forcing conversations and reconsiderations that had never happened when I wrote in solitary confinement. The students in our audience will spend most of their adult working lives in the 21st century. That century is going to bring more complexity, more ambiguity, more diversity, more technological change, more perplexing choices than we can imagine or probably care to. As we celebrate Higher Education Week, it behooves us to highlight those qualities which will equip a liberally trained person to cope with such a world. In fact, we should cherish those abilities which will help students move beyond coping to thriving in that changing, ambiguous, diverse world of the 21st century. The abilities that I refer to all relate to collaboration, an acuity of mind, heart, and ear, a tolerance for diversity and difference, a strong sense of one's own worth, quite independent of comparisons and competitions, and a courage to embrace open-mindedness despite its discomforts. A friend who teaches dance put it all quite well for me last weekend. She said that when a young dancer in her class begins to focus on how she is superior to the others in the class, that dancer immediately becomes too bound in her own body and cannot be free with her dance. Superiority and inferiority are limiting terms. They keep us bound to earth. They focus us on faults and defects. They hinder our reach and obstruct our vision. Collaboration builds on strengths and helps us stand on each other's shoulders to see farther and to reach higher. I want to be careful to avoid constructing a false dichotomy here. Collaborative effort is not antithetical to individual effort. You simply cannot be an effective member of a team if you depend on the others to carry you along. The group effort falters under that sort of burden, bogging down into mediocrity and limited vision. Only after painstaking individual effort, could Sir Isaac Newton write to Robert Hooke, quote, if I have seen further than you and Descartes, 
It is by standing upon the shoulders of giants, unquote. If he had done very little, or if he had merely borrowed from others' efforts, he would have had little perspective to be enhanced. Think about the image of standing on the shoulders of others to see farther. The taller you stand, the more you see. Even on the shoulders of others, you will see less if you have little stature of your own. The collaborative efforts of today begin, I'm oh, sorry, the collaborative efforts of tomorrow begin today with individual commitment, vision, and tolerance. But we all need to pay far more attention than we have to the ways and methods of cooperation. What we celebrate today are the giants who have offered us their shoulders and the collaborative spirit which has inspired us to climb up for the view. Before closing, I want to say how grateful I am for special individuals in my life whose tolerance, cooperation, inspiration, and courage have helped me along the way. I wish I could name them here today, but instead, I will trust that each one who is here today knows of my gratitude. Finally, I want to acknowledge the support given to me by my parents, Robert and Margaret Wiley, and to remind us, all of us, that of the debt we owe to mothers and fathers for their example, courage, and selflessness. My father is no longer living, but I would like to ask my mother to stand for a moment. Don't clap too soon. Now, would all the parents in the audience please stand while we express our appreciation for what they've done for us. Parents, parent of anybody. Parents are too modest. Colleagues, guests, and friends, thank you for your gifts of greeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandler, and thank you very much for your remarks so pointed to today with reference to collaborative learning, which is what we are celebrating today when we dedicate the Peace Chapel, and to recognizing parents, since this is our parents' weekend. And now we'd like to recognize Dr. Andrew Murray, director of the Baker Peace Institute. I should be pleased, Dr. Murray, to have you present Elizabeth Calhoun Baker, who will accept the honorary degree on behalf of the candidate Elizabeth Evans Baker, Dr. Murray. Elizabeth, will you join us? This is a cooperative. We're collaborating. Uh, they, yesterday I told Elizabeth Baker, uh, Elizabeth Evans Baker on the phone, that we would try to send her some good vibrations from this meeting. So if perhaps all of you can think about her very hard while I'm reading this, uh, she'll know that she's in our thoughts and that we're very sorry that she couldn't share this uh, special day with us. Mr. President, Elizabeth Evans Baker is a woman of talent, passion, courage, and persistence. She is a musician and has presided over a household that has heralded good music. She is an actress and has played major roles in The Queen is Green, Anastasia, The Importance of Being Earnest, and The Crucible. In 1958, she purchased the Monomoy Theater in Chatham, uh, in Cape Cod, and for more than three decades has, as a director, producer, and patron, brought season after season of the great plays to that region. In 1978, she established a fund to help young actors get started in New York. She is also a gracious hostess and has served 16 years as First Lady of Ohio University, which honored her in 1979 with the Doctorate of Humane Letters. At first, it might seem incongruous that such an elegant partisan of the arts should also have a burning concern for political issues that relate to peace, justice, 
and the manner in which we care for the earth. But both passions spring from a common love for grace and creativity. She has called us all to the simple truth that art cannot long survive in a world obsessed with destructive power. She and her husband, John Calhoun Baker, embarked on an adventure in the early 1970s that demanded uncommon courage and vision. In defiance of conventional wisdom and social expectations, she determined that academic communities should begin to devote material and intellectual resources to the tasks of examining war as a human problem and understanding and developing those attitudes and institutions in human society that lead to peace and the preservation of a clean and sound environment. Beginning with Juniata and then moving on to Ohio University and the Bethany Theological Seminary, Elizabeth and John established endowments which have led to Peace Studies programs. In addition, they have given major support to programs at Dartmouth and at the Brethren Peace Academy in New Windsor, Maryland. At Juniata, she has maintained a continued interest in the development of peace and conflict studies and has always been available both to sustain the discouraged and to disturb the complacent. Her generosity has touched the lives of countless students, making scholarships available, field trips possible, educational resources accessible. A long list of distinguished leaders and scholars brought to Juniata through the Baker-supported World Affairs Lectures has helped enrich all of our intellectual lives. Whether reading one of several thousand books donated to the library or eating in the Baker refectory or going to the Baker House discussion groups, it would be impossible to find a student on this campus who has not somehow been touched by the generosity of Elizabeth Baker. And now the chapel of the Baker Henry Nature Preserve will provide a place of serene beauty where students, faculty, and townspeople may go to refresh mind and spirit. Mr. President, because of Elizabeth Baker's courage and vision, because of her passion and persistence, Juniata is a richer place. We are richer materially, intellectually, culturally, spiritually. I take it as a personal privilege to present her for the conferring of the degree Doctor of the Main Letters. Betsy, you are standing in on this special occasion for your mother, Elizabeth Evans Baker. Therefore, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Juniata College, and upon them by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I now confer upon Elizabeth Evans Baker, in absentia, the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. mother and I would like to read the response that she would have delivered were she able to be here today. <clears throat> this is a most unexpected honor that is very touching and I do thank you from my heart. It has been such a great experience for me to find here in Juniata so many kindred spirits who have been willing and able to teach peace and indeed in their lives to show the spirit of kindness and love that the world needs so badly. Thank you, President Neff and trustees, for this honor. It is very much appreciated. Betsy, we ask you to present this hood in honor of citation to your mother, Elizabeth Evans Baker. And we want you to convey our appreciation for what she has done to Juniata College. And I think uh, remind her of what Andy Murray said earlier, that we were all sending our most healing vibrations her way. Blessed in our gathering, so may we be blessed in our scattering. To go and to play fairly, work joyfully, fight creatively, and love with abandon. Amen. <laughs>
friends to this beautiful, beautiful spot. Ours is a happy task to declare as a community that this <coughs> place of art will have for us a special function to stir within us the noblest of intentions that we should, in the beautiful words of St. Francis, be instruments of harmony, healing, and peace. <coughs> Ann Baker today will speak for her mother Elizabeth Evans Baker. Elizabeth Baker was one of two people who were especially responsible for this occasion. Elizabeth Baker, who has contributed to our life at Juniata in countless ways, first conceived the idea for a place of worship and reflection at the Baker Henry Nature Preserve. She, in turn, enlisted the participation of Maya Lynn, whose imagination gave birth to this site. Maya Lin's ability to work with the land to create art that resonates deeply in the human spirit has won her international acclaim as a designer. We are happy to have her with us to share with us regarding her work. Um, this sculpture of which you're sitting at the large circle is one of well, it's a two-part piece. The other, which is something I noticed when I first came to the site and is marked a bit too noticeably <coughs> right now by the path that the workmen had to use to bring old stone up there, is the second of this sculpture. I wanted to put forth a gathering place, but when I thought about it, it is not just a public gathering place, but what you also have is the thoughts that you may have on your own. The, it's the, sort of a gathering place of the group or the individual. So situated at the ridge, which is within those woods at the top, is a small circle. As this one is 40 feet in diameter, it is four feet, solid granite in diameter, a circle that is placed flush with the earth. It's a moss-covered ridge, so in time the moss will begin to grow over the stone. It's four feet so that one person can quietly sit there and contemplate, think, whatever. It basically frames the two ways in which we, we think, in which we gather. Um, 
I'll ask each one of you if you want it at another time to go up, but it really should be experienced alone with no one else out there. The choice of the circle comes from the fact that Elizabeth asked me to design a non-denominational place. And a circle is symmetrical, completely about its center. <coughs> there is no hierarchical order set up. Everyone is equal. There is no altar. There is no centerpiece. And um, that, that's what this place is. It's a very simple design. It's rough cut granite. Uh, we just chose field blocks. I didn't really want a manicured look. The earth will always stay grassy on the outside, fairly rough. But when it enters the ring, this will get dished out a little bit more, but it will be a perfect grassy, almost a concave, sort of contact lens shape. So you've got the natural order and then the boundary, and then you deal with sort of a, 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 a quietly implied order of man. And that's what this place is about. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Eternal Spirit, bind our hearts, we pray, to each other and to the blessed earth. <coughs> Be present in our celebration as we, by word and deed, set this place aside for special purpose. Hear our prayer of thanksgiving for those who have provided the substance and the creativity that have made this moment possible. Bless, we pray, the labor that has formed this work that what has been shaped by our hands will speak to our hearts and our minds. Amen. A reading from the 100th Psalm. <coughs> Sing to the Lord all the world. Worship the Lord with joy. Come before Him with happy songs. Never forget that the Lord is God. He made us, and we belong to Him. We are His people, we are His flock. Enter the temple gates with thanksgiving. Go into its courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise Him. The Lord is good, His love is eternal, and His faithfulness lasts forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My mother regrets very much not being here this morning. This is a very special occasion for her. I speak in her behalf and her words. I thought you would like to know how this chapel came about. Fifteen years ago, I came up this hill with John Baker and Jewett Henry when they were thinking about buying this land for Juniata. I was so struck with the beauty of these hills and the long vistas, I immediately thought, what a spot for an outdoor chapel. When President Neff came to Juniata, I got to know him and spoke to him about my ideas. He liked it, and I was and am delighted. Thinking about who might design the chapel, I thought of Maya Lin, who designed the Vietnam veterans from Maya, <coughs> and whose work we all admired. <coughs> Maya grew up in Athens, Ohio, where her father was dean of fine arts for Ohio University. We knew the family well, so I asked her to our apartment for dinner, and we talked about my idea for the chapel. I asked if she would like to design it. She said she would. So now here it is. <laughs> As the wall represented mourning for the dead, so this peace chapel represents her hopes for the future. Thank you, President Neff, Maya Wynn, Andy Murray, and all who helped develop the chapel. And now I will end by reading you a poem, <coughs> excuse me, a poem I wrote that my husband likes and wants included. <laughs> Under the boundless sky, a speck in the star-filled universe, this earth, this spinning planet, this world is God's gift to us. This place of worship, this circle of stone, we dedicate to God, our Creator, and may we truly be a people 
worthy of the sacred gift of life. Can you please join me in the litany of dedication. For those who seek moments alone to refresh the spirit or rest the mind, for those private times that call for meeting oneself without distraction or adornment. We dedicate this place. For those who seek the pleasure of company, the challenge and stimulation of community. For those public times when we are restored through the gathered body and stretched by common worship. We dedicate this place. For those who seek beauty, who will open themselves to the gentle touch of nature and the gentle prodding of the mind of the artist. For those moments when we confront the infinite in the particular, the feel of stone, the smell of breeze, the playful presence of form, and the rich chaos of creation. We dedicate this life. For those who seek peace, who will find here a renewed vision, a restored hope that men, women, and the earth will find a future together full of life. We dedicate this place to set it aside for this day for a special ground. <coughs> Let us pray. God, our Creator, Redeemer, Sanctifier, and Sustainer, mindful of your powerful presence in creation in your word, in sacrament, and in each other. We gather as your people to dedicate this place, to make it sacred space, to make it holy ground. This place gives us pause to refresh our drooping spirits. This place gives us nourishment to face an uncertain future. This place gives us vision and opens our hearts to possibility and potential not before considered. This place reminds us of your gentle and abiding presence. This place gives us peace. May all who ever gather here be refreshed and renewed. May this be a holy place, a place of praise, a place of prayer and reflection for all people. May those who come here be mindful that they must return from here more deeply committed to be people of service reconciliation and peace, but most of all, loving God. Hear the prayers of praise and petition offered by your people here, not only today, but always. Let it be said of this place, God dwells here. Here we find God. We ask all of these things in your name, you, our God, who live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. We thank Ty Furman and Nicholas Spadea, who are officers of the Campus Ministry Board, for sharing in our worship, and Father David Arsenault, who are leading us in the prayer. Father Arsenault is the Catholic Campus Minister. And we thank all of you for sharing in this very delightful and very beautiful moment with us. After the closing hymn, we would invite you to look about and to linger a moment and then to return to your cars because we do have luncheon planned and uh, we don't want to keep John Garrity waiting too long. Would you stand, stand please, and join in singing the closing hymn?